So the second lecture of the day is, in fact, the third and last lectures on, uh, on rational homotopy theory by John Morgan. Well, it's too early in the morning for pictures, so no pictures today. Uh, right at the end of my talk yesterday, I was uh, describing the what I call the one minimal model, which as we're going to see is um, uh, fairly closely related to uh, the fundamental group. So let me just start by recalling the construction. So this is, if you will, orthogonal to everything we've been doing up to this point, because until this point I've been assuming everything is simply connected in the spaces, and so all my minimal models that I built started with cohomology, started with the generators in dimension two. Now we're going to consider what happens for a general connected algebra. So A star is connected, which means that the cohomology in negative degrees is zero, and the cohomology in degree zero is the ground field, which we take to be Q, okay? But not necessarily simply connected. So I need to start this construction of trying to mimic the cohomology of A by a differential graded algebra with, which is free as an algebra and has decomposable D, I have to start that construction in degree one because I can have some first cohomology. So I start with the uh, exterior algebra on the first cohomology. Let me drop the A. So first cohomology means cohomology of A. And by the usual construction, I map this free graded commutative algebra into A by simply taking a basis for the first cohomology, choosing closed elements in A that represent those cohomology classes, taking the linear map that that defines, and then multiply to extend the, to the entire exterior algebra. So this map is clearly an isomorphism on the first cohomology, but the inductive step you need is that when you finished in some dimension, you have to have an isomorphism up to that dimension and an injection in the next dimension. So there's no reason, not necessarily injective, in H2. So we've gotten a nice representative for H1, but we don't necessarily have an injective map on H2. That will depend on what the cup product in H1 looks like. If the cup product in H1 is injective into H2, then we're done. We're finished. But if it's not, we have a kernel for this map in H2 that we have to put in more generators in degree one to annihilate. Because H2 over there is just wedged into H1. Right. So this is, we'll call this M11. So we're going to build the one minimal model, and this is the first approximation to it. So H2 of M11 is wedge 2 of H1. There's an OD. Yes, but I'm not worried about that. I'm not trying to make H2 onto. I'm only trying to make it injective. That's all I need to do. Those guys would be created for two-dimensional generators later in the construction. All right, so we look at the kernel of the map from H2 here to H2 here. And let's call that kernel V12. This is, if you will, V11. And now, same sort of construction we did in higher degrees works fine here. We take M11, which is this exterior algebra, and we tensor it with the exterior algebra on V12, this vector space, but put in degree 1 now. Okay. And we introduce a differential, which agrees here with the previous differential, that is, it's zero here, and D maps V12 into wedge 2 of H1 is the identity, or rather is an in inclusion map, right. Okay, so that's the D, and then that, this formula determines D by the Leibniz rule on the entire algebra. 
and we can map this algebra into A. Well, extending what we already have here, again, to determine the map, I just have to say where V12 goes. It's supposed to go to some elements in degree 1 in A that kill the cohomology image here. But these are exactly the classes which are cohomologous to 0, so I kill them. And that extends the map. Okay? So we call this M12. It includes M11 as a sub-DGA. And what we know is that the kernel on the map of H2 of M11 into A, H2 of A, is equal to the kernel of M11 into H2 of M12. Okay? Because anything that was in the kernel here we forcibly killed by putting in an element in this vector space to kill it. Unfortunately, we may create, or fortunately anyway, interestingly enough, we may create new kernel. Well, optimist or pessimist, I can't keep track which is better, but anyway, <laughs> because we, have, we certainly have new indecomposable elements in dimension two, and some of them might be closed. For example, if I were working on the link complement for the Borromean rings, and I talked about yesterday, M11 would simply be the exterior algebra on a three-dimensional uh, three vector space, the A, B, and C that we had, and it would map isomorphically to H1 of A, but all the cup products vanished. So V12 in this case, so this is S3 minus the Borromean rings, V12 in this case would be wedge 2 of H1, because the cup product is identically 0 in this manifold. And so we would have um, ABC tensor now, the exterior algebra on this V12, which has generators, uh, a, I call them A to AB, A to BC, A to AC. These are the one forms that formally at least kill AB, BC, and AC, and they map into elements, differential forms, dual to those submanifolds that I wrote down. Okay? So that completely annihilates wedge 2 of H1 in the cohomology here, but we've created new two dimensional cohomology classes. Those are those massive products I was talking about. For example, uh, uh, a closed element in this algebra would be, um, there are lots of others, but that's one. This is a closed element in this differential algebra. What does it represent over here? Well, the answer is we don't know until we know something about either the structure of this differential graded algebra or we know something about the space that this is the algebra of forms on. And we did a geometric computation in the link complement to show that these cohomology classes were non-zero. So they don't have to be killed at the next step. They're not in the kernel. But in other topological spaces with this same, or other differential algebras with this same cohomology ring, those classes might be trivial. The links might have been completely separate, and then, in fact, these classes would be trivial. Right. So this is a fairly delicate piece of information about the differential graded algebra or the space beyond cohomology, but which is captured in the differential forms and is captured in this construction. As you build the minimal model, you see, because you map these things in and you compute and you either get zero or you don't. You find the kernel. And the kernel at the next stage, you have to then continue the uh, construction if there is a kernel. So just to go on. So I, all I'm saying is that the map from M12 into A star can have a, a new kernel that you didn't see at the previous stage. And that, that map and its kernel are delicate information, more delicate information about the space or algebra than just the cohomology ring. Okay. But anyway, you continue this construction. And back to the general case, we have. M11 included in M12, 
We keep going. At each stage, we're adding generators in degree one to kill the kernel in H2 at the previous stage. So always M1N is an ex a Hirsch extension of M1 one n minus one by some vector space again in degree one and d maps v into the kernel of h2 of m1 n minus one into h2 of a star okay this is isomorphism right. and then that maps we can extend that map into a and we just keep going this process may terminate after a finite number of steps, or it may not. M1 is then simply the union of these guys, union or direct limit. And clearly, we have a map of M1 into A star, just the union of the maps that we construct at each stage. They're all compatible. And this map is an isomorphism on H1, because at every stage they were an injective on H2 because any closed class here lies in some finite stage and hence dies at the next stage. Okay. So we finished. May take us forever, but we finish. We've solved the problem. Okay. All right, well, so this is, you know, if you're in a manifold, you'd be calculating the way various co-dimension one and co-dimension two surfaces intersect or move around. Yeah. Exactly. Good point. Yeah. So good point. So Mike is pointing out a fundamental fact that I should have made clear earlier on. This process is repeated, repetitive in dimension one. You never seem to get out of dimension one. But if you, there are massy products like this in higher dimensions. But the dimension of the massy product is the sum of the dimensions minus one. So if you start higher up, you get even higher up. And then when you try to kill it, you're far enough up that the process is moving forward, upward in dimension. It's only when you start, <coughs> excuse me, in dimension one that you have to do it over and over and over again in dimension one. That's the sort of formal difference at this level. That's what Mike was saying. Because it's a degree minus. That's right, because you drop degree minus one for the Massey product, and then you have to solve the equation d equals, so you get a minus two. So if these are all one-dimensional, you're back in dimension one. If these are all two-dimensional, you're up to six minus two is four. So <coughs> the process moves up in dimension. Are there higher products that are bigger degree that are going to get stuck? Yes. Yes. Everything possible can happen. All right. So this is an algebraic construction we make with differential forms, and it, we could dualize it if we're in a, in a manifold to submanifolds and co-dimension one and two and their intersection patterns and so on. I want to say what the homotopy theory, in classical terms, what this is about the homotopy theory of the space. So how is this related? to ordinary homotopy theory of the space. Of course, now I'm imagining that A is the algebra of differential forms on a space. Okay? And the answer is it's related to a very nice part of the fundamental group. And I, I think I'll uh, derive the answer before I tell you what it is. So let's think about these um, differential algebras. They all look like at each stage we have an exterior algebra on a, on some vector space, finite dimensional uh, rational vector space. And then there's some D. There's a well-known construction that goes between 
differential algebras generated in dimension one and Lie algebras. And let me do it uh, inductively so that I'll get, um, get the full structure here. So let's let L. I mean, this is, yes, you're right. Yes, I mean, so this is maybe a slightly, well, I mean, I haven't said how one tensor is related to another tensor. Right, I haven't said what the monoidal tensor structure is, but it's the skew. Yeah, that's implicit. So let ln, well, remember each one of these algebras has the, um, subspace of indecomposable elements, which in, for all these algebras is all the stuff in degree greater than zero, the positive degree stuff. And then the indecomposables are the positive degree stuff mod the square of the, these are ideals, mod the square of the ideal of positive degree stuff. And in our case, well, they're just the vector spaces of generators, and they're all in degree one. So let ln be the indecomposables of M1N over the square of the, in, of the positive degree things. And so this is, in the algebra, this is all in degree one, but I put L in degree zero. So I forget the grading, or I make the grading. So L is, degree of L is zero, or the grading for L is zero, okay? So L1, is simply V11 dualized. L2 is V11 plus V12 dualized, and so on. Where does the dual come from? I put it in. I just, that was my definition. Ah. That's because I didn't write this correctly. Thank you. So take the indecomposables, which is a vector space sitting in degree one, and dualize it. Here we had a sequence of extensions. When I dualize, I'll get a projective system instead of an inductive system. I'll get, maybe actually I'll do it this way, L1, L2, L3, each one of these being the obvious rejection. Okay, these are surjective. The, the piece of this view is going to become the bracket. Well, just hold on a minute. Okay. Now, we have the differential D, which maps the indecomposables I mod I squared into uh, I wedge I mod, or I squared mod I cubed. So D is decomposable. So D of any indecomposable element is decomposable. D of a decomposable element by the Leibniz rule is triply decomposable. So you get an induced map here. And this is simply wedge 2 of I mod I squared. Does it need to go into I4? No. D of A wedge B is D of A wedge B. <laughs> All right. So we have the map D I've now interpreted as a map from the indecomposables to wedge two of the indecomposables. So let's take its dual, and that will be a map from wedge two of LN back to LN skew-symmetric map. Well, we have one equation, which is d squared equals zero. When we dualize that equation, we get the Jacobi identity. So this is a Lie bracket. Jacobi is exactly dual to d squared equals zero. That's a nice elementary exercise. So we get this uh, projective system of Lie algebras. Okay.
But it's even better than that because so, so we have the equation that D of V1N is contained in M1N minus 1. So D shifts the V back into the previous algebra. When you dualize this, you see that the kernel of LN to LN minus 1, which is VN minus 1 dual, is central in LN. So we have this extension of Lie algebras, short exact sequence, okay? And this guy is, in fact, central in here, the central extension. That's right. The bracket of V1N star with LN equals zero. And that's dual to this fact, if you work through it. Okay? Well, the first algebra here, L1, is, of course, just the first homology of the space because it's dual to the first cohomology. Mm -hmm. It's nice abelian Lie algebra, brackets trivial. The bracket is the dual of D, which is trivial, so the bracket is trivial. So we start with an abelian Lie algebra, and we do a sequence of central extensions. So in fact, we get a tower, a projective tower, of higher and higher order nilpotent Lie algebras. So now let me turn them around, L1, L2, L3, and so on. Ln is a nilpotent Lie algebra. Yes. Well, the, the brackets vanish. I mean, the definition of nilpotent is a bracket of some length vanishes, and it follows easily. It's equivalent to a sequence of central extensions. But anyway, it's a nilpotent Lie algebra of length, if you will, less than or equal to n. I mean, the length of nilpotency less than or equal to n. Well, nilpotent, these are defined over q. A, a rational nilpotent Lie algebra is the same thing as a rational nilpotent group, because you can take the baker campbell hausdorff formula to define a group structure, the exponential, on Ln. Maybe we call it X of Ln. The underlying set is the same set of, of the rational vector space, but the multiplication is given by the baker campbell hausdorff formula, which is usually a power series, but here, because of the uniform nilpotency, is in fact a polynomial with rational co I mean, it's a power series with rational coefficients in general, but by the nilpotency, it becomes truncates and becomes a polynomial with rational coefficients. So it's a well-defined multiplication on this rational vector space. Okay? So we have a tower of central extensions of rational nilpotent groups. So these are Q nilpotent groups. So this one is unchanged. It's still the first homology. The next one is some nilpotent group of length 2. You have the commutators off of the L1 being something in the center of L2 and so on. And that construction is exactly dual to this construction, iterated construction, of putting more generators in degree 1 and taking D. So I built a rational nilpotent group. That simply means that Every center is a rational vector space when you take the, the nilpotent, the central series. That the nilpotent group and at each stage the center is a rational vector space. Okay. As a group. That's right. You t keep taking these kind of commutators. Take the lower central series rather than GN, GN. Okay, well,
what, what is this tower of nilpotent groups? It's the rational nilpotent completion of the fundamental group. So this tower, projective tower of Q nilpotent groups is the uh, Q nilpotent completion of the fundamental group of the space. So let me just talk for a moment about that. Associated to any group, there is a projective system of nilpotent groups. Simply take the quotients by the terms in the lower central series, which is what we started to do here. So you start with G, you have the commutator subgroup. This is G1, this is G2. Then you take G, G2, this is G3, and so on. At each stage, you do this. Okay. If you take any quotient, G mod Gn is a nilpotent group of length of nilpotency n, by definition. And it, of course, maps to G mod Gn minus 1 with kernel, which is Gn mod uh, Gn minus 1 mod Gn. And that, by construction, is a central subgroup inside here. So this is central. So you can do this for any group, in particular the fundamental group of a space, and you build a tower, a projective tower, of nilpotent groups. And of course, it's universal with respect to maps from the original group into, let's call them now, L1 of x. I should have done it the other way. L1 of x, L2 of x, and so on. You have maps of the original group in, just the quotients, G into these quotients. And this is, solves the universal problem of mapping this group into nilpotent groups or into projective towers of nilpotent groups. This is the universal solution, the universal nilpotent tower associated to this group, obviously by construction. Now, anytime you have a nilpotent group, there you can tensor a nilpotent group with Q, just like you can tensor an abelian group with Q. You do it one stage at a time through the central series. That's called the Malchef completion. Malchef gave a very different sort of description of the group. But anyway, you can then tensor this tower of nilpotent uh, uh, groups with Q, and you get a tower of rational nilpotent groups. And this is what you build. This is what the one minimal model gives. is dual to. Gives through this construction. Starting with a one minimal model, I dualized the generators, got a tower of vector spaces, which I then argued were in fact Lie algebras, rational Lie algebras, and I exponentiated them and got a tower of nilpotent rational groups. That's this tower. If I start with the differential forms on X, build its one minimal model, dualize, I'll get a tower of rational nilpotent groups. It is this tower. Okay. Now, that's all I'm going to say about the fundamental group. Let me just make one remark about mixing the fundamental group with the higher degree construction. In fact, one can mix them. Uh, if you start with a connected differential algebra or the differential forms on a connected space, you can first build the one minimal model, which is an infinite construction. You take the union or the limit. That produces something that's an isomorphism on H1 and uh, injective in H2. And now you can start in higher dimensions. You take what's left over in H2, you hit that, and now you'll move up. Well, 
what uh, I'm not sure what you mean what goes wrong this is all you get this is all you can see using the differential form so for example if you have a not complement in the three sphere so it's first cohomology is Z and that's it and you can't tell by differential forms you can't tell it from the unknot just using the differential the homotopy theory of the differential algebra because you'll start with to do the construction say over the reals you would start with one closed form that represents the generator you map the exterior algebra on that closed form in that's an isomorphism on our cohomology you're finished you haven't seen that it's knotted so that it's knotted is from this perspective deeper in the fundamental group than the lower central series if you have a perfect group then you don't see anything here so. I mean there there is a variant of this theory which allows you to do a little bit or do something if you sort of specify a representation into a, a Lie group and you sort of work over that, but I'm not going to try to talk about that. But if you just do the kind of constructions I'm talking about, you will not see this extra information. Okay. Well, I was trying to say that it's, it's possible to meld these two constructions together. First, do the minimal model in degree one, which is an infinite process, but nevertheless, you can construct it. And then you start in the higher degrees and you work up. So you can associate a a minimal model in this sense to any connected algebra or any connected space using the Q polynomial forms and what you get is the rational form of the nilpotent homotopy theory what you're understanding is the category of all maps of this space into spaces whose fundamental group is nilpotent and whose action of the fundamental group on higher homotopy groups is also nilpotent all those spaces can be tensored with Q, and that's exactly what you're understanding. If you were to take a K pi 1, which is a homology three sphere, like glue two knot complements together, its nilpotent homotopy theory is the same as the nilpotent homotopy theory of the three sphere. So in nilpotent homotopy theory, it looks like the three sphere. Of course, its actual homotopy groups are very, very different because it's not a nilpotent space. But if you want to map this thing to nilpotent spaces, You'll never see anything more than what you can do by mapping the three sphere in. The group can't be recovered at all from nilpotent spaces. So the one skeleton is going to go trivially, and all you're left with is the top cell. So you get pi 3. So that's what you recover in general about spaces. A space doing this construction, you can understand it's what it looks like when you complete it with respect to rational nilpotent spaces. And that may or may not be related to the, say, usual homotopy groups, which are maps of spheres in, not maps to spheres. Okay. All right. Well, I want to give you um, three, two kinds of uh, consequences of this theory. First of all, first of all, I want to look at the automorphisms of homotopy types. So X now is going to be a finite complex complex it's going to be simply connected so we're back to the simply connected world well we now have a model for X it's a rational differential graded algebra and I could look at its automorphisms okay. and this is a rational algebraic group what's well, an algebraic group affine algebraic group defined over Q because it's, well, it's a subgroup of, of GLN. So it's, look at GLN. You have a finite number of polynomial equations with rational coefficients that define a subgroup of GLN. So I could take GLN of Q and look at the Q points, GLN of R, RC, and get other groups. But what's important is the, that they're, all, they're defined by polynomial equations inside GLN. Well, there's only one thing I have to say here. This minimal model for X may well be an infinite construction. It may well go on 
far above the dimension of X because the homotopy groups may go on up there. Nevertheless, the automorphisms are completely determined by a finite piece of the model up above the dimension of the space. So you can just truncate and forget things, maybe one above, two above the dimension of the space. So we're talking about automorphisms then of a, of a finite dimensional vector space with some structure on it, a multiplication and a D, and the automorphism then is an element in GLN, it's supposed to preserve degrees, it's supposed to commute with multiplication and commute with D. Commuting with multiplication is a polynomial formula. Commuting with D is a linear formula, in fact. So there's a quadratic formula and a linear formula that determine whether or not an element in GL of this vector space is going to be an automorphism of this algebra. So that's a, a rational algebraic group. All those polynomials are, since the algebra is defined over Q and the differential is defined over Q, the polynomials defining the algebra are rational, polynomials are rational coefficients. Yes? Well, let me give you a homotopy theory answer. If you have an automorphism of, of X, of the homotopy type of X, which then will give you an automorphism of all the homotopy groups. It's determined by what's happened on the part of the Poznikov tower, say, dimension of x plus 1. So there's a differential form version of that, too. Everything else, I mean, there are other automorphisms, but they're all homotopic back to, they're all homotopic, the extensions are all homotopic to each other. Anyway, so the automorphisms of this minimal model is an affine algebraic group defined over Q. One problem we have to think about is some of these automorphisms may be homotopic to the identity. In fact, in general, they will be. Um, and there are several ways to go about this, but uh, the one that Dennis wrote down was the following. Think about um, maps of degree minus 1 from M to itself, uh, like chain homotopies that are derivations. So I of A, B is I of A, B plus or minus A, I of B. Okay. So look at derivations of degree minus 1 and then consider their commutator with D. Okay. This, this turns out, so the collection of maps like that as I vary I over all derivations of degree minus 1, these make a Lie algebra of elements commuting with D. What is the statement in the bracket? What about? I want to take the collection of all of them. So this, I mean, this is a vector. Take, take all maps that satisfy this equation, and for each such map, form this element. You'll get a linear space of maps of degree 0 of the algebra to itself, commuting with D. Okay. And now exponent, so this is like the Lie derivative. You think of I as like a vector field. This is the Lie derivative of the vector field. And they make a nice Lie algebra, and I simply exponent exponentiate. This is also, uh, e it's easy to see that it's, um, uh, what I want to say, that the, p the powers, uh, well, this expression, the exponential of id plus di, which is id plus di plus a half, id plus di squared, and so on, terminates after a finite number of steps. some n, and defines an automorphism of the Lie algebra, uh, automorphism of, the, of m. So these give automorphisms of m, the minimal model. They're all homotopic to, uh, to, to the identity. So these give, just like uh, exponentiating uh, the Lie derivative of a vector field just gives you the flow generated by the vector field. 
exponentiating this thing gives me an automorphism of M, which is homotopic, and in fact, I produces the homotopy, homotopic to the identity. And it's not too hard to show that all automorphisms of M homotopic to the identity arise this way. So what we might call the rational automorphisms, well, the rational outer automorphisms of the minimal model are then this algebraic group divided by the image under the exponentiation. Well, we're exponentiating a, a nilpotent Lie algebra. We're going to get some sort of unipotent group. So we have some kind of unipotent algebraic group, which is the image. So this is a new algebraic group. Yeah, but in matrices, they've got ones down the diagonal. Okay. So they're unipotent matrices. So in fact, the outer automorphisms are also a linear algebraic group defined over Q. And you know, algebraic, uh, linear algebraic groups defined over Q have this so-called so um, Levy decomposition. They have the, the uh, reductive part, and then they have a unipotent kernel. And the automorphisms of M and the actual automorphisms up to homotopy have the same reductive part. They just differ by some unipotent, uh, this unipotent group, which sits in the maximal unipotent subgroup. Okay. It now follows from this that the automorphisms of the original space, and now I'll take the Z automorphisms, actual homotopy automorphisms, is commensurate. with the integral points of this algebraic group, this Q algebraic group. No, it differs by, has a, differs by, the, the two groups have subgroups of finite, have a subgroup of finite index in common. So up to groups of finite order, or subgroups of finite index, I should say, the actual homotopy automorphisms of this simply connected space and the integral matrices in this rational algebraic group are the same. In particular, the automorphism group is finitely generated. So it's up to this finite commensurability, it is a group of integer matrices in some rational algebraic group. That theorem was already known or not? So it, that was a new theorem. Oh, the finite generation. Well, the whole the whole statement. So I was going to actually go on and say something related to a piece of that, which is, uh, so surgery theory is about uh, simply connected, well, the best part of surgery theory is about simply connected manifolds of dimension five and higher. And the strongest results are for piecewise linear manifolds or after Kirby's triangulation for topological manifolds. Uh, but by Crevere and Milner and uh, various other people, we knew that the smooth classification was only off by a finite discrepancy from the topological or PL um, classifications. So the statements I'm going to make are true in all the categories for simply connected manifolds of dimension five and higher. So a simply connected, well, so such manifolds 
is determined up to finitely many possibilities by, let's see, it's integral, I need some sort of integral structure. So let's say the integral cohomology ring. I mean, I need to control the torsion somehow. And by, what else do I need to say? The rational Pontryagin classes. And the rational, uh, well, the, the nilpotent homotopy type, so the, the minimal model. Okay. I think that's what you were trying to say, right? And now we begin to understand what the auto, how the automorphisms act. We know how they act on the cohomology and the rational Pontryagin classes. Now we see what the action of the automorphism looks like on the minimal model. All right, I want to, in the last 10 minutes, talk about formality. So the definition of a differential algebra being formal or a space being formal is that the minimal model of the algebra, I'll do it for the algebra, is actually also the minimal model of the cohomology of the algebra. So in other words, there's a map of differential graded algebras from the minimal model to the cohomology, which is the identity on cohomology. And this gives us an identification of cohomologies. Okay. Well, sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. Spaces which are obviously formal, well, the spheres, Sn, are formal. Complex projective space, Cpn, is formal. These are fairly easy to see. A space that's not formal, S3 minus the Borromean rings is not formal because, well, for many reasons, but in particular because in a formal space, all massy products vanish. So you can compute massy products. That's a rational differential algebra up to quasi-isomorphism invariant. So you can compute the massy products here or here. We've already talked about that, really. But if you have an, a DGA isomor a quasi-isomorphism between the minimal model and the cohomology, you can commute, compute the massy products here. Well, when you compute massy products, you have some cup product equals zero, uh, cup product is zero in cohomology. And you have to solve the equation, find something whose d is equal to that. Well, in cohomology, d is 0. So if a cup product vanishes in cohomology, it's already 0. And the only way to solve the equation, well, the way to solve the equation in this algebra is to take 0 goes by d to 0. And then when you compute the massy products, they vanish. So in fact, being formal in some sense is the vanishing of all massy products of all orders in a uniform way. You could imagine you might have one way to see one massy product vanishes, another way to see a related but different massy product vanishes, but those ways couldn't be made compatible. That will all be captured somewhere in the minimal model. And if the, if the space is formal, then all the massy products vanish and they vanish uniformly. And that's really what this statement is about. that you can make, well, you have to make, okay, well, what I mean by uniformly is when you write down a massy product, there's an indeterminacy. 
but we're actually working with actual forms. So we don't want to talk about Massey products modulo the indeterminacy. Every time we, we can solve the, every time we have to solve the equation, we have some closed form we've already constructed, but it turns out to be exact. We have to write it as d of something. We have to make those choices uniformly over all the possible choices in this, this dimension, make them once and for all and linearly. And then I can compute a bunch of Massey products, actual closed classes, and look at their cohomology using those particular forms. They might be in the indeterminacy, but that doesn't matter. If they're non-zero, they're non-zero. So that's what I mean by, I, I don't know who asked the question, but that's what I mean by uniformly. Now he asked, what do you mean by uniformity? Okay. Well, so what, is, what does formality say about the fundamental group? Well, of course, it only says something about the rational nilpotent completion of the fundamental group, but it says that the rational nilpotent completion, so if you have a formal space, then the rational nilpotent completion of the fundamental group is as free as possible given the cohomology ring. Is there an example for that? <coughs> Simply some answer for that. Sorry? The example you gave is kind of basic to that principle. Yes. Uh, if I took S3 minus this, that's a formal space. A space whose fundamental group is free is formal in degree one. And this is an analogous statement. I, have, I won't formulate it more precisely than this. If the cup product were zero, this would be, say, as in the link complement, this would be saying the rational nilpotent completion agreed with that of a free group. But the cup product can be non-zero, and it still makes sense to talk about as free as possible given this nilpotent two-step. And that's what you get. So, right. 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 So it's not a free group, but it's as free as possible given that one commutator. Right. So the higher order mass, the higher order massy products, all the massy products and all the higher order massy products all vanish. And it's just a question of which ones you can define. So, this is a strong restriction on a group. Okay. And then the theorem that I want to end with, which was due to Delinia, Griffiths, Dennis, and me, was that any compact Kähler manifold. is formal. Maybe, actually, let me say one more thing about formality. I had hoped to talk about how all this rational homotopy theory, at least adumbrate how this rational homotopy theory is related to some of the more modern developments in the interactions between algebraic topology and various kinds of geometry going on today through the A-infinity structures. And I didn't get to say that, but so there's a fact that the minimal model is in the category of differential graded algebras. You can always collapse it down and find a quasi-equivalent object which, whose underlying ring is the cohomology ring, but with an A-infinity structure here. So there's an A-infinity isomorphism between the minimal model and the cohomology ring, but you need all these higher products in the A-infinity structure. Formality is when you can take that A infinity structure, in fact, just to be the cup product, and you need no higher order terms in the A infinity structure. So if you know about A infinity structures, that's another way to think about what formality is. And that would sort of prove the formal space on the 
yes, you also define the Massey products out of the A infinity operation, so that's right. Okay. Okay, so the, the basic ingredient in the proof of this theorem is something called the DD bar lemma. And that says the following. So in a Kähler manifold, the, I'm going to work with the complex differential forms. And they have a Hodge decomposition, PQ, and the exterior D decomposes by types into a type 1, 0, differentiation with respect to the holomorphic coordinate, differentiation with respect to the anti-holomorphic coordinate. Um, and the DD bar lemma says that if you have a class alpha, so you have a form alpha, and um, alpha is closed under all three of the differentials. Of course, these two imply this is, if these are both zero, then this one clearly is zero. But if it's zero under all three differentiations, all three uh, derivations, and alpha is exact under one of them, then, in fact, it's exact under all three consistently. Then there exists a beta, is that alpha is dd bar of beta. And anything like this is clearly closed under d bar, d bar squared is zero, it's closed under d. It's closed under d bar because you can switch these two at the No, I'm going to show that, I'm going to reverse it and show that this satisfies the hypothesis. Any form like this is closed under round D, closed under round D bar because you can switch them up to a sign and therefore satisfies all these equations and is clearly exact under round D, but also under round D bar and under round D and under ordinary D. Okay. So that's the DD bar lemma. It's proved using the basic Kähler identities. Um, identities using the Kähler metric. And then, so this allows us to make a diagram of differential graded algebras like this. So the DD bar lemma implies that, yeah, so I'm looking at all the differential forms. I'm looking here with D. I now look at those forms that are D bar closed. That's a subalgebra. And D restricted to those forms is D bar, is round D because D bar vanishes. So <clears throat> this is a subcomplex inside here always. Now I can, I can project kernel of D-bar onto kernel mod image, and that's what you would call the D-bar cohomology, and I can take the induced differential, because D and D-bar commute, there's an induced differential on cohomology, which in fact you prove is zero. And these, so, well, yeah, okay, so I can do this. That I can always do in any complex manifold. The DD bar lemma implies that this is an isomorphism on cohomology, this is an isomorphism on cohomology, and this is zero. Okay. And therefore, the minimal model for this thing, this thing, and this thing are all isomorphic. They're quasi-isomorphic differential graded algebras, and therefore we have formality at least over the complexes, and now we can go back to our algebraic groups and see that, in fact, uh, formality over C implies formality over Q. It's a nice little argument about uh, reductive groups or the Levy decomposition. Or something. So, in fact, these are rationally formal as well as complex formal. All right. That's a good place to stop.
can you give any simple examples of, uh, of, of so in a formal space, I'll not say products, but coherently, can you give a simple example of a non-formal space where all massive products vanish non-coherently? I'm sure I could, but not off the top of my head. I mean, if you really want to see one, I'm sure I can work on that. I mean, I, I can make like a, a big, ugly one, but I still think like one of the small things. Uh, one that arises geometrically well, surely some link complement will do, but be a little careful about it. You mentioned this, um, you take these derivations of degree minus one and a commutator with B and you get a differential Lie algebra concentrated in degree zero. You get B bracket I, take yeah. all yeah. Yeah. So you have to do a little computation. Is there anything interesting about taking maybe all derivations, or is this somehow related to homotopy groups of the automorphism group? Uh, I'm sorry. You want to you want to drop the degree minus one? Is that what you want to do? Yeah. Well, we have we do have a derivation of degree plus one, which is d. Um, I've never thought about derivations of other groups. You can take all the different graded derivations and just make a complex Lie algebra. Then it's kind of the idea is this gives a model the space of automorphism. Mm -hmm. This that I actually works. works. Yeah. yeah. So there's a model. I don't know if it's going to prove it. Um, so is there any uh, idea about what's the geography of formal and non-formal spaces? Um, I'm sorry. What the what? What's the geography of Oh, geography. I think being formal is is a fairly tight restriction, and if you just sort of throw in things at random, you're not going to get a formal space. I mean, some spaces some spaces don't have any choice. Their cohomology is such that automatically they're formal, no matter what the space is given that cohomology range. For example, if the cup product from H1 to H2 in embedded H, uh, wedge 2 of H1 inside H2, that would be one formal. Because right, I do the first step, and there's nothing to do with the second step. John? CP infinity is also formal for the same sort of reason. But if you have more complicated spaces where there's a possibility of non-formality, then generically you will have non-formality. For example, if you have an elliptic space, mm -hmm. it, the only the only way it can be formal is if it's a product of odd spheres with a polynomial algebra divided by a regular sequence. So just about any elliptic space is not formal. Okay. So that's <coughs> yeah. For hyperbolic spaces, for example, hyperbolic three manifolds. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, hyperbolic three manifolds. I mean, most, to me, most hyperbolic three manifolds have h1 equals zero, so they're formal. Why? Because that was, those are just the ones that weren't understood before. Right. The, because well, because all the others are, are nice and geometric and probably, <coughs> well, maybe they're all nice and geometric up to finite covers, but you know, the ones that fiber over the circle and stuff like that seems special. But I mean, just just depends on the cohomology ring, whether or not it's automatic automatically formal or not in, in general. Okay, uh, thank you, speak again, and uh, 